All right, I wanted to take a minute and uh, create a brief video to go over a couple of the really important topics that we covered um, in a previous lesson uh, as we started to talk about t-tests. Specifically, I want to address the concept of statistical significance. Um, that is, how do we know when the difference between uh, two means or a mean in a population is a real difference or if it's just sampling error? And then the other concept has to do with errors. When we make one of those inferences, um, there's always a chance that we are wrong. And I want to help you understand or better understand the concept of type 1 and type 2 errors. So uh, let me clean things up nicely here. Okay, so what I've got here on the screen are three apples, and we're going to say that these three apples are our population, um, roughly. They all came from the same, not the same tree, but the same species of apples. These are all Fuji apples, if that makes a difference. Um, and so you can see, by looking at them, they're not all identical. That is, they don't have the exact same color, the exact same shape, the exact same um, markings on them. But nonetheless, they're all fairly similar, just like people, right? We're all part of the same human population, but we all have individual differences. But there are enough similarities that we group them together. All right, so there's our population. So here's a research question for you. Did the apple that I just put up on the screen come from the same population as the three apples on the left? Well, from a research perspective, um, we've got our hypotheses here. The null hypothesis is that this apple came from this population and that the only difference is due to um, individual variability from one apple to the next. Our research hypothesis is that it came from a different population, a different type of um, apple or a different population of apple trees. So we have a null hypothesis and a research hypothesis. Um, and just looking at the apple, what would you conclude? Would you accept the null hypothesis? Or excuse me, would you reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis? Well, hopefully, it's pretty obvious um, that this green apple is a Granny Smith and nothing like the three Fuji apples from the population. So in this instance, we would reject the null hypothesis because it's um, although it is round, we would still consider it an apple. It is different enough that we don't, um, uh, we wouldn't accept the notion that it's a part of the same population, the same species of apple. All right. So in this case, we uh, take the null hypothesis H sub zero, and we reject it. So let me clean it up. I'm going to shrink this apple down. We're going to move it up here, and we are going to say uh, H sub zero is rejected. Okay, erase our markings. All right, new research question or new experiment. What about this apple that just showed up here? Okay, we once again have two hypotheses we're comparing against each other. Um, the null hypothesis says that this apple came from this population. That would be H sub zero. And the research hypothesis says that, nope, it came from some other population that differs from um, the, you know, the big population. So uh, let me make things a little bit cleaner here. So what would you say? If we look carefully at it, it's a little bit, uh, I mean, it's still an apple, obviously. Um, it's got a little bit different coloring, perhaps a little more um, green than red. Uh, it's a little more misshapen. So what do you think? A little bit tougher, isn't it? Perhaps you decided that the differences is a little bit too much. Definitely not as different as our green apple that we saw earlier. Um, but different enough that we say, no, we are going to, um, again, reject the null hypothesis and conclude that this apple came from some different population. Well, guess what? This is, this apple is a Fuji apple. It does belong to the population, but it might be something that we call, you know, an outlier or just one of those extreme scores.
So it does belong to our population. But because it was just different enough that you might have been tempted to say it doesn't belong, we will have made um, what's called a type 1 error. Type 1 error. A type 1 error occurs whenever you reject the null, right? That was the null hypothesis, and you rejected it when you should have accepted it. It really does belong to the population, but because it was different, you thought that it didn't. You rejected the null, and you made a type 1 error. Okay, so let's clean this up now. Shrink it down, move it away, and let's ask another question. All right, everything's cleaned up. So what do we have now? A new apple, same uh, uh, hypotheses in play. Either this apple belongs to the population um, to the left, and the only thing different about this apple is individual variability, but otherwise it's still a Fuji, belongs to the population. Um, that would be the null hypothesis. And then the research hypothesis is that no, it is different enough that we're going to um, make the decision that it belongs to a completely different species of apple. So what do you think? Well, if we look at it, it's reddish, um, like the, um, the population, uh, more red than the, the other green one. It's a little taller, a little skinnier maybe. Uh, the Fuji apples are nice and round. Um, but gosh, you know, there is a lot of variability in the sizes. What do you think? Well, again, it's a tough call. Maybe you said it's clearly different. But what if you decided that the similarities were too close and so you decided that the, um, the null hypothesis is true and that it really does belong to the population? Well, guess what? This is not a Fuji apple. It's a, oops, a jazz, that's jazz, a jazz apple. It does not belong to the population of Fuji apples. So if we decided to um, not reject the null hypothesis, if we decided that it really was part of the population, we will have made what's called a type 2 error. A type 2 error is not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is incorrect. So let me clean things up here and see if I can put all of this together. So what we have here is a population. Population that maybe looks like this. So the average Fuji apple is round with a little bit of yellow specks and kind of a mottled red color, but there's individual variability, okay? But nonetheless, there are Fuji apples that look like Fuji apples and some look a little bit misshapen maybe and not Fuji apples, okay? And then we found um, or identified one apple and we had to make a choice. Now, our hypotheses are that they all came from this population with this mu. That would be H sub zero. But our alternative hypothesis, or our research hypothesis, is that there is perhaps some other um, population of apples that um, we're drawing from. And so we have to decide, did this apple come from this population or that one? Well, I think when we were talking about it, um, it was tempting to conclude that it, came, it was a little bit too different, a little bit too green, a little bit um, not, not enough like the others, so that we put it into H sub 1. And that was a type 1 error. So let me write that down here. Type 1 error. If we put it into the different, we rejected the null and said it was so different, it came from a different population. In contrast, uh, I'll use a different color here. When we made, when we looked at this apple, 
We said, well, yes, it's not exactly like the three from the known population, but it is reddish, um, and so it's conceivable that it came from um, the main population, but we just, you know, individual variability. It looks a little bit different. So we, in fact, failed to reject the null hypothesis and instead concluded that this apple belongs to uh, the main population. But in fact, it doesn't. It really is a different type of apple. If that's the case, then we will have committed a type 2 error. Okay? Saying that it belongs to um, uh, the population we're comparing it to when it really doesn't. A type 1 error is saying that it doesn't belong to the population when it really does. And then lastly, which was actually our first decision, we saw that clearly this green apple is different than all the others and we had no problem concluding that it belongs to a different population and that is a correct decision. Okay, so those are the three um, possible outcomes of any decision that we make in research um, based on our statistics. Either we are correct we are correct in rejecting the null hypothesis, or we are correct in failing to reject the null hypothesis. But we might also be wrong if we are um, if we reject the null, because remember all statistical tests are a direct test of the null hypothesis. So if we rejected the null, and we say that um, our sample came from a different population, but in reality it did not, that's a type one error. If we failed to reject the null and say that our, um, our sample comes from the population that we're comparing to, it's not different enough to reject the null hypothesis, then we will have committed a type 2 error. Let that sink in for a minute and I'll wrap this up. Okay, so what I've done here is I'm, I'm reproducing one of the um, figures in my lecture notes, and it's a common figure in stat books all over the place. So along the top of the figure um, is the real world state of the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is either true or false if we were able to test the entire population and look at every single Fuji apple there ever was, we could tell from, with certainty if you know, any given apple was a part of that population. Uh, so we would know whether it's true or false. However, in reality, we never know that. We instead have to make some kind of decision. So this is where we um, are doing our research. We are going to either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject, that is, accept it as a viable um, explanation for our results. If we reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that uh, you know the apple came from a different population when the null hypothesis really is false we are correct I'm gonna over right over the lines here okay that's really good we did that with the green apple we said the null hypothesis is false we rejected the null and in that case we made a correct decision granny apples are not Fuji, Fuji apples um, similarly, if we had concluded that this apple was in fact a Fuji apple, it was just a little bit different and it belonged to the population, we would have also been correct. Okay, We um, accepted the null hypothesis. We could not rule it out. This apple was similar enough to the others that we're going to say it is a part of the um, the population, and if that's true, we were also correct. Yay! But what happens if we reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact true? And in fact, in our talk a couple of minutes ago, we actually did put this apple in a different population because it was a little misshapen and a little too much green. And anytime we reject the null, when we should not have we committed what's called a type 1 error. Okay, 
because this is a Fuji, oops, Fuji Apple, and these are all Fuji Apples here. Okay, and this is a Granny Smith Apple. And what about this last Apple? Um, this one actually was different, but if we had, um, I'm talking about this one, if we had said, no, it's reddish, uh, just a little bit different, so we accept the null hypothesis, but in fact, it's a jazz apple and doesn't belong, we would have accepted the null when the null was false. And that is the commission of a type 2 error. The point is, um, in reality, we never really know if we've made a type 1 or type 2 error at any given time because we don't know the state of the real world. It's just impractical, if not impossible, to be able to test an entire population. The only way we come close to knowing is through the process of replication. If we make a decision and we replicate the study or some other laboratory replicates the study and does the same thing that we did and they come up with the same conclusion, um, the, the rules of probability suggest that we probably didn't make an error, right? Um, if we come up with a single rare finding that nobody else ever would, it would get caught under replication. So we don't always know if we made a type 1 or a type 2 error. But if we re repeat the study numerous times and we get the same answer every time, then we have confidence in our decision. Okay, so um, that's the concept of type 1 and type 2 errors. I want to... Um, and the last thing that I wanted to comment on was um, the concept of significance. So in, psycho or in the sciences, a finding is significant if we determine that it is real or reliable. Now, we can never prove anything because there's always a probability that we're wrong. But significance means that there is a very low probability that we are wrong. And if you remember from uh, the lecture and from the chapter, in science we've decided that any time something happens, the probability... Whoops. What happened? There we go. The probability of an event happening by chance alone, if it is less than 0.05 or 5%, then it's significant. The point is that we use our knowledge of probabilities and the properties of that normal curve so we know exactly what proportion falls within one and two and three standard errors of the mean. That if the null hypothesis were true, any finding that would occur fewer than 5% of the time we decide is pretty rare and we're on, on better footing if we decide to reject the null under those circumstances. So again, we never know for sure if the null hypothesis is true, but we can calculate the probability of, a give, of obtaining a given finding. And if we decide that that probability is very rare, it's not likely to have occurred by chance, is it possible to get a green apple, an all green apple from a Fuji tree? Sure, it's possible. Uh, there might have been some genetic defect or some mutation or something like that, but it's just not likely to happen very often. So we have more um, confidence or we feel more certain that the null hypothesis is false and we're going to reject it. And that's what we mean by significant. Anytime we conclude that a difference between a sample and a population or between two samples is so rare that if we were drawing from the same population, it would happen not very often, fewer than five times out of a hundred. We reject the null hypothesis and say instead that the difference between the means is significant. It's real. And through the process of replication, we can decide if that decision was a good one or not, or, what, or if we made a type 1 error. All right, so that concludes this little um, recap of the concept of significance and errors. And it's a very important part to understanding inferential statistics because all inferential statistics involve decisions of significance and the chance of making a type 1 or a type 2 error. So make sure you understand this.
um, is, will come up again and again and again. Thanks a lot.